Hello and good morning everyone. Welcome to our webcast, It's All in Your Head. My name is Angie and I am here with Hiroko de Michelis today to talk about biofeedback, the science of mind and body combined. Before we begin, I would like to tell you a little bit more about Hiroko. Ms. de Michelis is a registered clinical counselor with a master's in psychology and positive psychology. She has trained in the field of optimal performance with elite athletes, executives, children, and individuals wanting to achieve their potential. Much of her early training was done with her father, Dr. Bruno de Michelis, the owner of the de Michelis Mind Room, most noted for his work with the Milan AC and Chelsea FC soccer teams. She's also trained in mindfulness-based approaches from Bangor University in the UK and in REBT Cognitive Behavioral Therapy from Birmingham University in the UK. Hiroko is also a board-certified neurotherapist. This morning we're going to have two breaks so we can answer your questions. You can also send them to us through the chat feature located in the control panel on the right side of your screen. Okay, let's get started. Let me welcome Hiroko de Michelis. Yes, hello, good morning Angie, good morning everyone on this Saturday morning in Vancouver. I know that we also have some international participants, so maybe it's evening for them. So good evening and good morning to everyone. Um, today the title of the presentation is Biofeedback, the Science of Mind and Body Combined. And then we also have a subtitle, uh, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers, and I took that title that I think I find funny and ironical title from um, from a book uh, by an outstanding um, American scholar, Dr. Professor Sapolsky, Robert Sapolsky. Um, Robert Sapolsky is a neuroendocrinologist, um, a neuroscientist and a neurobiologist at Stanford University. His research has been focusing on stress and neuronal degeneration, and Professor Sapolsky spends half of his time at Stanford University and half of his time in Africa studying baboons and stress on primates. Lots of the information, apart from the book of uh, Dr. Sapolsky, um, are also to find in Bertolt Swingle's book about which Angie is going to give us more information later. And let me tell you a little bit about the Swingle Clinic and what we do, what we do here. Mainly, at the clinic we focus on neurotherapy. What that means is that we're measuring neurological parameters in order to assess and treat several conditions and disorders. Typically, one of the ways of doing this is measuring EEG, electrical activity from the brain, from five locations and then processing what we find out and summarize our findings in a report. So this is what our report looks like and uh, um, in the clinic we see many correlates of anxiety, depression, sleep disorders, problems such as OCD, a very vast array of disorders. And today I would like to create as much as possible a link between what we do with this tool and the psychophysiological approach. So let's start with this almost a swear word, the psychophysiology. What is psychophysiology? What we mean with this word is a branch of psychology that is concerned with the physiological basis of psychological processes. So I would like to explore a little bit of this combination using some of Dr. Sapolsky's teachings. Today I have some bad news and I'm going to talk about how does stress impact our lives and most importantly how it does impact our health. The fact that stress has a toll, it has a price and it has an impact on our physical well-being. And then I would like to focus on something quite specific, which is human stress and why is human stress different than um, stress for other living beings. As a matter of fact, we are quite unique as humans. humans as humans, we, for example, love art. We go to art galleries, no zebras would. We cry for a movie. We enjoy poetry. 
we might get angry at traffic or fear that someone might hate us. As humans, in fact, we think. As humans, we have empathy for other species, something really unique in the natural world. But also, uh, and on a Saturday, lovely sat Saturday morning, I have some good news, which is just because of those human characteristics, we can consciously control our stress levels. So before we proceed, I need to um, use another swear word, which is homeostasis. And some of you might remember this word from uh, your grade 9 biology classes. Homeostasis, it's a Greek word coming from homeos, homoios meaning similar, and stasis, standing still. So it's this notion around which the body has, has its ideal state, um, as an ideal state that it's constantly trying to maintain, an ideal state of acidity, an ideal state of oxygen that it needs of temperature. So as an example, when the external temperature increases, then we produce more sweat to get rid of the heat. So the whole idea is that change for the organism as is seen as something extremely dangerous or threatening, so that the, the brain will continually try and counterbalance changes that threaten that homeostasis. So another very interesting and simple concept is the concept of stress. Anything that moves us away from that homeostatic balance is a stressor. And today I would like to differentiate between different stressors. Stressor for a zebra might be very different from a stressor, <coughs> sorry, for a lion, or stress for humans. And there is another human here. <laughs> so why? What is the difference? Well, for a lion, a stressor uh, taking it away from that homeostatic balance could easily be hunger, for example. So this lion in the savanna starving to death. His glucose levels are dropping. And what happens is adrenaline kicks in in promoting muscle activation. He's running fast, his heart rate speeding up, and he's running like thunder to chase a zebra and eventually reestablish that homeostasis, that sense, state of balance. If he does not ingest anything, it will be bad news. For the zebra, well, the stressor is the hungry lion. <laughs> so he's been chased by the lion, and he's also running like thunder. And then he's lying in the savanna, in the sand, maybe half disemboweled, wounded, bleeding on the dust, and if his heart does not speed up trying to bring up blood pressure, then it will also be bad news for, for the zebra. Now, human stress. What we have described in those two examples were real stressors. And stress, in that respect, is an adaptive response. There is a real danger, Danger, the person is attacking us, the well-known fight-or-flight response. Another category is alleged real stressors. Maybe someone is raising his hand, we think that that person is attacking us, and instead maybe that person only wanted to wave at us, maybe he's an Italian person, uses his hands a lot. <laughs> And so we think that is an attack, but in fact it is not. We might see a snake, get scared, only to find out that in fact that was a fake or plastic snake uh, or maybe just a toy. Now, the third category is imagined stressors, imaginary stressors. So we're lying in bed, 3 a.m. in the night, and we're thinking. We're thinking of our office, we're thinking that there might be someone that is hating us. We hear the phone ringing, we imagine a worst case scenario. We maybe think of our mortgage, of our boss. And those things we're thinking of become as lions chasing us. And in fact, they are triggering the same reactions in our body 
as we were running for life in the savanna. So there you go. Psychological stress is stress that is generated in our heads, in fact, in our human heads. Sit down, a zebra, and try to explain how stressful it is to have a mortgage, and I am pretty sure he won't understand much of what we're saying. And again, to quote Sapolsky, how many hippos worry about whether social security is going to last as long as they will, or how many hippos will worry about what they will say on their first date? Not many, you will agree with me. So, the idea here is that there are dangers, like spiders, crocodiles, zebras, lions, and all of those triggers, trigger a stress response. But then, there are imaginary fears, and our human fears are these. Our office, our daily life, traffic, our phones. So, the core concept of stress and disease, the connection between body and mind, is that as humans we turn on the same psychophysiological responses as we literally were mammals running for our lives in the savanna. This is the base of psychological stress. Psychological stress is triggered by thoughts and memories. And the point is, in the savanna, Stress is a three minutes terror. So after that, uh, after those three minutes, you're either dead, and the stress is over, or you're alive, and stress is over too. No rumination. Uh, the zebra doesn't hold any grudges towards the lion for chasing it. So stress is a short-term crisis. Now. As we mentioned, humans have thoughts and memories, and we prolong those three memories of terror into 30 years of hate for our jobs, worry for our future, grudges to our partner, and we prolong a response that was designed evolutionarily for acute physical emergencies. I am seeing messages about my microphone. I hope you can hear me well from Italy. I receive indications. Please position your microphone better. So I don't know if you can hear me. You, if you guys can hear me better like this. Yes, I hear someone thanking me from Italy. So reaching 11,000 kilometers away with this microphone. So there you go with my new better place microphone. The idea here is let's let's pretend. Let's pretend that we're making an exercise. Let's try and think of a scary situation. Let's think of our first job interview or presentation we gave or a first date. What 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 happens in our body when we're thinking of that? Maybe our heart is beating faster. Our hands are colder and sweaty. Maybe we have to just try and, you know, dry them up against our, our pants. Who hasn't done that before an interview? Our muscles feel tense and our breathing becomes more shallow. Um, so this is something that, for example, we measure at the clinic with the stress assessment. All of, all of you, they are uh, therapists, practitioners, uh, I see many in the, part in the list today, um, know what we're doing with the stress assessment. We are measuring that physiological response. But in fact, um, this notion of the connection of the brain and the brain being the main mediator of physiological change is relatively new. So for a long time, it was thought that peripheral glands of the body had their own regulatory processes, uh, that they knew what to do. So for example, male sex drive decline with age was attributed to the aging of testicles, secreting less testosterone with age. Um, in fact, in the 70s, um, earlier on in 1971, uh, the first pieces of research were published, and then in 1976, 
two researchers won the Nobel Prize, Shali and Guillemin. In fact, they were two remarkable scientists and they were huge enemies with each other and these apparently contributed to their, um, to their research. They were competing against each other with who was publishing research first. The, um, the, the, big, the big piece of discovery they made is actually those physiological changes were brain mediated. It's the brain through the release of hormones that mediates physiological change. So the hypothalamus, the base of the brain, um, through a huge array of releasing and inhibitory hypothalamic hormones, regulates a very small gland, the pituitary gland. And this uh, circulation um, um, process, uh, this is circulatory, um, uh, circulation process is as tiny as a dot in this slide. It's very, very tiny. So the, the hypothalamus tells the gland in the body what to do and then when to secrete hormones. So it's the brain that regulates peripheral glands. So there you go. Uh, there's something stressful, the brain sends the message alarm, alarm, and then that message um, uh, is mediated in the body. When we experience something stressful, the hypothalamus secretes a whole variety of hormones, um, for example, CRH, so corticotropin, releasing hormones, and after 50, less than 50 seconds, CRH triggers the pituitary to release ACTH, also called uh, corticotropin. And with a few minutes, ACTH is in the bloodstream. It reaches the adrenal glands, which release stress hormones, such as corticosteroids, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and all of those names like cortisol that we have heard so many, so many times in common language. So the idea here is not to say that stress is, is, is bad. Actually stress, it's a fabulous, fantastic strategy, but it's a short-term stress crisis. What it provides is, is energy now. So to whatever muscle is, uh, is going, to save our lives, energy has to be delivered immediately, now. It has to be in circulation, not stores in the cells for spring. Uh, the idea is like going to the bank and cash out from the savings account, uh, send uh, uh, hormones to the fat cells, to the liver, and uh, get the glucose out in the bloodstream now. The second point, the second strategy is delivering that energy. So increasing the heart rate, the breathing rate, so that the, that the glucose can as fast as possible be delivered to the muscles. What else? Uh, what happened during stress is we're switching off long-term projects. Long-term is too optimistic during stress. So, for example, if a lion is getting energy from his fat cells, um, it, it doesn't need to get, um, it's, not, uh, it's not productive, it's not efficient to get energy from its digestion. Digestion is too slow. It takes hours and it takes almost 20% of the energy, of our energy. So, um, digestion is shut down. And that's why when we're stressed, our mouths get dry. That's why our gastrointestinal system shuts down. Um, other processes that get shut down, growth, reproduction, all of these fertility problems related to stress. Well, guess what? That's a very optimistic project. If a lion is chasing you, maybe ovulating or growing are not priorities. So you're going to switch them off. Growth hormones, tissue repairs are sh sh a tissue repair are shut down, and all of those beautiful optimistic projects uh, are delayed if there is a later. What else? Turning on the immune system. Well, that's another fantastic strategy. If a lion ch is chasing you and you get wounded, you want to protect yourself from infections. 
and what else? You want your blood to thicken in case you're bleeding, so incre increase of blood clotting. What else? Diminish, diminishing uh, the, the, the pain threshold. So there you go, in terms of stress, that sounds like stress-induced analgesia when people don't feel their physical pain. And then, last but not least, is what happens to the brain. Well, the brain shuts down thinking. The prefrontal cortex is flooded with hormones, and there is a substantial fall in our cognitive perform uh, performance. So if I am in danger under this type of stress, I will not be concerned of being able to solve any cognitive or mathematical tasking. Uh, all I'm interested in, in is running away. So there you go. These are all strategies activated when I'm under stress. And already, many of you might see the connections between these adaptive responses and modern problems, modern diseases, cholesterol, too much glucose in the blood, heart disorders, blood clots, autoimmune diseases, adrenal fatigue or pain syndromes. So again, just to create this deep and I really think fascinated um, correlation between the body and the brain, there you go. Uh, this is the area of the cortex, the prefrontal cortex that we use for reasoning, for logical thinking, and that's the part that gets inhibited. Uh, this is one of the reactions that we, meet, we measure when we do our brain measuring with the EEG. So there you go, if you look at the clinical cue, one of the ratios that we're very passionate of is the low to high alpha ratio. And uh, typically for brain efficiency, we want to see the values sitting below 1.5. So this is what happens 3.5 in case of that non-efficiency, um, that inhibition of the prefrontal cortex. Uh, that ratio is too high and it's one of the things that we work a lot with when we want to um, increase and help people increase in their performance. So another way of looking at this, these are some of the beautiful slides I inherited from Italy, moderate anxiety, fantastic strategies of so thoughts uh, through the brain, instructing the glands, driving the muscles and leading to a performance action there is a flow without interferences. But what happens when the anxiety is exaggerated? Well, in that case, is that flow is disrupted and that communication from brain to glands to muscles actually lead to a mistake. And we've seen that in top athletes very, very often. So remember I had promised that this would not be a depressive Saturday morning, this would be actually also about good news. So the good news is that we can consciously control stress because of those characteristics, because of our being unique as humans, because we have thoughts and we have memories. But, like in the best uh, television productions, I'm going to leave you with the good news after the break. And so the break is about uh, maybe some question and answers. I'm going to let the uh, word to my beautiful friend Angie, and, um, and there you go. Thank you, Hiroko. Uh, I have a couple of questions here. Um, one of them is, um, and perhaps we're jumping the gun, but how can biofeedback help me cope with real life stressors? That is a fantastic question, and yes, I think we are jumping to the second part of the, of the presentation. But uh, there you go, the, really the metaphor of biofeedback is the metaphor of sailing. And as Michael Thompson in Toronto has it as a, as a logo, slogan for his, for his center is, you cannot really change the wind, but you ha can learn how to sail and how to use your sails. So biofeedback is a, is a lot about learning about self-regulation. How is it that giving those stressful uh, features or stress or events in our life, how can we best self-regulate ourselves? And we're going to speak about a notion called long-term potentiation. How, we, how is it that we can reinforce 
positive and efficacious um, neural pathways. Um, so it's a very good question. I hope I will reply to it uh, during the second part of the conversation. If you allow me, I have another question here. Yes. Someone is asking me about ulcers. Uh, the presentation is about why don't zebras get ulcers? So what is the physiology of ulcers and the connection with stress? And uh, um, let me just quickly summarize that actually the physiology of ulcers is very complicated and it's somehow associated with a, with a bacter, bacter called the um, Helicobacter pylori and it's a very, very complex physiological phenomenon which correlates the presence of this bacter to other factors such as uh, life quality, smoking, drinking and stress is uh, one of them. But one of the other theories is that of acid rebound. And the idea that digestion happens through an acid called hydrochloridic acid, which is a very aggressive uh, component, a very aggressive ingredient that we have in our stomach. Uh, this acid destroys everything we eat, from meat to cheese, all of those you know, heavy um, substances, substances that we eat. So the question here is, why does the stomach then not destroy itself because of this high acidity of this hydrochloridic acid? Um, why does it not digest itself? The idea here, here is, again, the, the body is extremely intelligent and it's designed to protect the stomach through some layering of mucus and bicarbonate. So the body is protecting itself uh, through layering the stomach uh, from itself. But now what happens with stress, with prolonged stress in time? As we mentioned, digestion is inhibited and so therefore less hydrochloric acid is like a, a very difficult to pronounce, in the, is in the stomach is produced. And as a consequence, the stomach will then be uh, trying, as Dr. Sapolsky has it, cut corners or intelligently save energy. So it will, as a consequence, produce less bicarbonate and less mucus. So guess what? As soon as we start eating again, maybe we have, I don't know, a piece of cake to celebrate the end of stress, we will start again the secretion of that dangerous or aggressive acid. But guess what? Our defenses are down. Our stomach is not layered, is not protected. And this is what will create damage. So we have to be very uh, careful also with the recovery from stress, really taking care of ourselves. And the idea here is, yes, it's a good title, why also zebras don't get ulcers, but maybe zebras in, in zoos can get ulcers too. When the stress is prolonged, this is what happens. So that's a very short summary of the physiology of ulcers. Thank you, Hiroko. Um, we, um, we're going to answer the rest of the questions on the second break. Uh, and, and if for any reason we don't have time to answer all of your questions, you can also send us an email, angie at swingleclinic.com, and we'll get back to you. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. So we were going to talk about good news. And in order for us to talk about the good news, uh, we need to address um, some more uh, biology or neurophysiology. Um, we're going to talk about the autonomic nervous system. Um, the autonomic nervous system is more or less like the control panel of our car. And it has two divisions, the accelerator and the brake. So the sympathetic nervous system is responsible for emergencies, and we saw quite a few today. is is responsible for arousal, for that fight and flight response. It's driven by adrenaline, noradrenaline. We saw that digestions get blocked with sympathetic activation. As opposed to that, we have the parasympathetic nervous system which drives calm, napping, digestion, uh, 
and it's mediated by acetylcholine. Muscles are relaxed, respiration is deep and slow, our hands are warming up, no sweat in our hands. So it's the, bra the brain sending signals of calm and peace. So as we have it today, when you as a lion are chasing a zebra, you're activating your sympathetic nervous system. And when you as a zebra get opened into by a lion, you're also activating your sympathetic system. So I guess today we spoke a lot about that sympathetic response. Now, in opposition, almost in a choreography, works the sympathetic nervous system. Again, remember we spoke about that homeostasis. One inhibits the other. So the whole notion in who practices um, psychophysiology, biofeedback, is the idea that the parasympathetic response uh, as well as the sympathetic, uh, they can be measured. Um, all of those responses that we spoke about, they can be easily nowadays measured with some pretty much sophisticated sensors, but more and more they will be available to general public. So EMG sensors measuring the electrical firing of muscle fibers, um, sensors such as skin conductivity, temperature, uh, peripheral temperature sensors, they can measure uh, that micro sweat response, EKG or BVP, so blood, vol, uh, blood pulse uh, sensors, and sensors that can measure breathing. So this is very familiar for um, some of you that are in the field. This is, for example, a stress assessment, and you can see, I think, a little picture of who that stress assessment belongs to down bottom on the right. Um, so with this, we have an objective measuring of those physiological changes. We can see how much um, it can be a um, intelligent and efficacious strategy and how much we, on the opposite side, we are paying the consequences of stressors. So, so there you go, this whole notion that uh, of the measurability of stress that I think will become more and more relevant with portable devices and apps on our smartphones. Um, but the idea here is further, is further. The idea here is, yes, we can measure it, but also because we can measure it, we can actually train the parasympathetic activation. So what we are saying is that as humans, we have the possibility to change the response of the autonomic system in a conscious and volitional way. So how is that even possible? Who can do that? People ask me <laughs> when I do uh, presentations of this type. How can I you know, learn, gather control of inner organs? Well, when people ask me that question, I reply with another question, which is, well, raise your hands, all of those that have been toilet trained, for example, all of those that have learned the volitional control of the autonomic nervous system uh, in terms of an internal organ, such as the bladder, that is uh, control of, a, of a, the autonomic nervous system. So in the same way, we can learn parasympathetic activation. We can learn how to relax our muscles. That's one of the most, I guess, immediate or intuitive uh, type of training we do. We can learn how to breathe in a deep and slow way. We can learn how to warm our hands, how to make our hands drier. All of that can be learned. And um, so how do, how do we do that? How can we learn uh, how to do that? So here's what, what we do in psychophysiology. We connect that person to a sensor that measures, for example, heart rate or muscle activity or sweat. And then we ask that person to think. There is the human, uh, the human special, unique characteristic. To think. To think of a music or a beautiful holiday, or to something positive. Uh, 
and the person herself can see those parameters changing, can see that physiological response is changing. And then as practitioners, as therapists, we ask, aha, what is it that you were thinking of? and uh, you hear what that person is saying and then you ask, well, do it again. That's great. So the person learns how to consciously, cortically recall memories and thoughts that reinforce the activation of the parasympathetic nervous system. And then just to reply to that question that was asked earlier, thanks to a, another notion called long-term potentiation, the more we, we practice, the better we become, the more skilled we become at evoking those cortical states that activate that st sense of relaxation. It's like walking on the sand, and the more we walk on the same path, the wider, the deeper will become that path in the sand. So we, we become better at evoking when in need, when life is hitting us, uh, uh, to uh, trigger and to gather um, uh, positive in terms of uh, uh, positive in terms of being able to uh, calm ourselves um, mental states. So one of the main and I will not <laughs> say this enough. I love this slide. Keep calm and breathe deeply. One of the main and most simple um, interventions we do at the clinic is breathing. And I will not say enough how breathing is easy, but it's not simple. The notion of breathing is actually very complex. So we are very, very passionate about working with breathing in this clinic. First of all, breathing reflects that interaction of the sympathetic and parasympathetic system. When we're breathing in, we are activating the sympathetic system, heart rate goes up. When we're breathing out, we're actually triggering the parasympathetic system, and so the heart rate goes down. So this is an notion called, again, many of you that are practitioners know a lot about this, RSA, respiratory sinus arrhythmia. This is a very efficacious starting point uh, um, when, we, uh, when, we, when we work with our clients uh, around breathing. Uh, but again, breathing is much more than that. It's so complex that it's mind-blowing. Breathing is about the importance of oxygen and the importance of carbon dioxide. So normally we would think of carbon dioxide as something negative that we want to get rid of. And this is true up to a certain extent. In fact, carbon dioxide is extremely important for our well-being and for our psychological health. In fact, it's, uh, carbon dioxide is responsible for delivering oxygen to the organs and tissues, uh, just according to their metabolic needs, which might be different. So when we're breathing in a certain way that we teach at the clinic, we are actually um, uh, teaching the person how to increase carbon dioxide levels in their blood. And the reason why is that we want to lower the pH of the blood. We want to increase the acidity of the blood. The reason is that with uh, the, an increased acidity in the blood, uh, the ability of the hemoglobin, which is the transporter of oxygen in the blood, um, the ability of the hemoglobin to release oxygen to the cells is increased. So by the simple fact of learning how to breathe efficiently, we're actually increasing the delivery of oxygen to the cells. It's like a um, healing process that costs nothing once we have learned it. And it's, uh, it's pretty powerful, and we all should learn about this. So there you go. This is why I have my slide about keep calm and breathe deeply or more accurately, keep calm and breathe efficiently, keep calm and learn how to breathe. So there you go. I think um, I would like to wrap it up.
with uh, leaving again uh, some space for questions and answers to Angie, who I know also has uh, some um, some information for us. Uh, as promised, she's going to talk a little bit about uh, Dr. Swingle's book, um, which is very um, uh, very interesting in terms of. Oh, sorry, I need to go backwards because we're still here. Uh, Dr. Swingle started with psychophysiology, so he there is a it's a great introduction to the side uh, the the field of psychophysiology's book, and then she's going to tell us about a couple of events uh, taking uh, taking place in in the next uh, few weeks. So there you go. Uh, Angie, did you have any other questions? I do. Thank you, Hiroko. Um, the first question is, how can we stop uh, having too many um, thoughts and being anxious? <laughs> Thank you. This is a fantastic million-dollar question. Um, first of all, visiting the clinic, because uh, that's what we're very passionate about. We integrate um, biofeed with with mindfulness-based approaches, or uh, how I like to call it, technology-based mindfulness, a uh, very good way of um, lowering anxiety and quieting the brain is actually focusing on breathing. When we measure brain activity, we realize that it's, it's a little bit uh, of a trap thinking that we can silence the brain. Uh, the brain can, in fact, not exactly be silenced, but we can learn how to calm the brain and we can learn how to divert thoughts. So a way how we do that is focusing on our breathing. And many people find that focusing on the breathing, breathing as you're monitoring your own breathing, it's, um, it's very effective because many attentional units are, are engaged and so it's, um, it's a very good first starting point. So yeah, please come and visit the clinic. We're very passionate about, uh, about these types of intervention. Thank you. That was a good question. Thank you. The next question is, what kind of habits do you suggest I can incorporate in my daily life, obviously in addition to biofeedback, to be less stressed like a zebra? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, that's another good one. Um, well-being, psychological well-being is like exercise and um, it's like having a ritual that we are um, taking care of every day. So there are many, many components. Breathing is one of them. Mindfulness meditation is another one. Exercise is fundamental connection with others, having control in aspects of our life, very beautiful and simple research they made in an hospice with elderly patients. Just the fact of giving a little plant to the, to the guests and telling them that they were responsible of watering that plant gave those guests the, uh, the uh, idea that they were responsible for something, that they have a certain amount of control. Uh, on their lives or on some aspects of their lives. So science has given us so many um, evidence-based um, interventions that we can do. Now the matter is we need to, uh, to uh, implement them in our lives. So we need to make the time, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes in our life uh, to implement these uh, strategies, breathing, meditating, connecting with others, exercising. Very simple device that Dr. Swingle has in his, uh, uh, among his products is the ped pedometer. So walking, uh, that's another great one, but we need to implement them. Uh, we need to be abysmal at self-care and that's, uh, that's, quite, uh, that's quite important. Thank you. Thank you. Another very good question. Um, and finally, um, could you give us an example um, of, of someone that you've helped who has benefited from this? Yes, of course. Well, I see many, many clients every week and uh, along my two years at this uh, clinic I have encountered many beautiful 
many beautiful uh, stories and uh, um, it's difficult to choose one but this incredible woman a very uh, actually very wealthy and a very talented artist she suffered from adrenal fatigue so severe that she couldn't function anymore and she did a whole series of neurotherapy interventions at the clinic that we then combined with a psychophysio with a phys physiological approach just to complete and graduate her uh, to you know to normal life and normally we ask our clients to come back once they have graduated just a couple of times a year and uh, she just uh, sent me a couple of pictures yesterday with uh, two amazing sculptures that she has terminated uh, this week and that for me was uh, very touching so um, those are the moments that make my my job really meaningful Thanks, that was another very good question, just to remind myself. <laughs> Thank you, Hiroko, that was, that was very informative. Um, and again, if there are any other additional questions, uh, you can uh, send them to me via email at angie at swingleclinic.com. An important question that we, we get a lot is when are these slides going to be uh, uploaded and available to the public? We post uh, the recording of all of our webcasts under swingleclinic.com forward slash media. There's a section there for the webcast and usually within a week or two there you'll find them um, online. Okay, well thank you very much for participating. I just have some announcements and then we'll, we'll wrap it up. Thank you for joining us today. Um, we were talking a little bit about Dr. Swingle's book. His most recent book um, is called Biofeedback for the Brain and we like to think that it is the most important book that you'll ever read for yourself, your children and your grandchildren and we have it available online on our Sound Health Products website and also at local bookstores. We also have the Clinician's Guide. It is literature for professional therapists. It is being um, published right now, it's in the press, it's not ready uh, yet, it's being revised, but if you want to be added to the wait list, you can send us an email and then we'll put you on the wait, the wait list when it's, um, when it's out, which we hope it's any day now. Also for professionals, we have different workshops um, that are three-day workshops for professional practitioners. Participants are instructed on every aspect of the setup, recording, and treatment phases of neurotherapy so they can apply the assessment and treat treatment procedures in their practices. And if you want more information, you can email me for dates for next year. And this we're very excited about. Due to popular demand, we're going to have another free public lecture in Vancouver at the Central Library on a couple of weeks on October 30th at 7 p.m. This is a free lecture and if you want to learn more or to register you can visit our website swingoclinic.com and look under events. If you enjoyed this webcast you will happy to know that we have them every month. Next month we'll be talking about the neurotherapeutic treatment of addictions and to learn more or to register you can also visit our website under events. We also have products for home use. Um, Hiroko mentioned one of them, which is our pedometer. Um, we also have CDs and other uh, products that you can use at home. And you can find them on our Sound Health Products website at soundhealthproducts.com. And this is it. Thank you so much for joining us this morning and evening to all our international uh, <laughs> listeners. Um, <laughs> We hope you, you enjoyed this presentation as we did and we will be back live on November 8 to discuss the neurotherapeutic treatment of um, addictions. Have a great weekend everyone. Thank you. Bye bye. Ciao ciao.